The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone saves, serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A very interesting story uh, in John's Gospel. The first of the miracles that Jesus performs as recorded by John. And John does say that that was the first of the many miracles he performed. But uh, in a rather ordinary kind of sense, Jesus and his friends are invited to a wedding. And I wonder, what kind of a guest was Jesus at a wedding, and what kind of gift did he bring? Did, did they have a money dance after the ceremony? I don't know. Did he wait for the cake, and it was like, I'm leaving as soon as the cake is served, because that's normally what I would do with a wedding, right? Um, it, this wedding serves as a setting, as often is the case in Scripture. It's not about setting itself or what's taking place, or what's more about what's taking place and as Luther would say, what does this mean? But I have a question for you first. When I say to you or you hear the word glory, what comes to mind? Anything? <laughs> the awesomeness of God. Yeah, that's what well, Brian said, the awesomeness of God. That's certainly one way uh, to think of it. Of course, like most of our words in our language and any other language, there's multiple meanings to them, and they have different connotations. From a for sort of secular sense, glory has the sense of, uh, of someone being praised for an amazing accomplishment, doing something remarkable, uh, and then there is a sort of glory that is attributed to that person for doing what they did, whether it's in athletics or in arts, um, whatever it might be. They, Sometimes the extraordinary acts of a parent raising a child. My son moved out yesterday. Uh, I'm still dealing with the emotions of all of that. But to my credit, he moved, right? That's an extraordinary act. It's When you make life as easy as I made it for my son, for him to want to move is pretty extraordinary. It's to my glory that he did that. Um, and we, so we attribute that... Uh, that now to people that they accomplished something that was um, to their glory. Uh, it also is a verb. There is like a way to use that as a verb, as a descriptor. No, that's an adjective. A verb is an action word, right? They did something glorious. I did something glorious in raising my son to move out. The biblical sense of glory is something altogether different. And Brian, you kind of nailed it. That it's the awesomeness of God. Um, in order for there to be something that can be considered glorious, or an achievement that is glorious, there has to be some sort of a standard. You know, like if I did an eight jumping jack, no one's going to go, well, that was really awesome. What an achievement for you, because there's people that have done probably thousands of jumping jacks, one after the other. There has to be some sort of standard. And from a biblical perspective, and from a just pers general theological perspective, uh, Glory is, God is the standard for glory. 
God is the standard for perfection. There is no being or anything greater. There's no thought higher than. There's no wisdom greater than, no truth, no justice. All of those attributes that we use to describe God, there are none greater than God. And so the glory is all of those things. The glory of God is all of God's perfection in all of the ways in which we describe God. It has sometimes to do with the power of God, with the might of God, with the wisdom of God, with the compassion or the mercy of God. Glory is attributed to God because God is the highest of standards. And it has a different sense in terms of the Bible, in the way that it's used, and in the way that it's manifest. Is glory really glory if nobody witnesses it? Is there an attribute or an achievement that can be praised if it's not witnessed? It's the old, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody sees it, did it actually, does it actually make a noise? Uh, I have a real life example of that. Uh, most of you I think know I'm a golfer. Uh, I used to play golf uh, quite a bit by myself when I was a young man, when I first started playing golf. And one day I happened to be out on the golf course late in the afternoon, all by myself. There was nobody else around. Like for, I couldn't see any other human beings. And came to a par three, and of course I made my first hole in one. <laughs> Some of you might be thinking, sure you did. <laughs> Nobody saw it. I was the only one there to witness it. Um, my second hole in one, yeah, I've got two of them, yay. It's been a while. Nobody saw it actually go in the hole except for me. Thankfully, I was with my grandmother and a friend of hers who were completely ignoring me when I was in the tee box, talking to each other. And after I went in the hole, I was like, hole in one. Because it was like 4.30 in the morning, I got up to go play golf with my 80-something-year-old grandmother. I was still asleep. But they saw me walk up and take the ball out of the hole. But they didn't witness it. The first one, until I had that second one, I could tell people I had a hole in one, but nobody saw it. So there has to be some sort of experience that goes with this achievement. And that's very much true in the way that God's glory is manifest. If God is the highest of thoughts and ideals and all of the perfection that I spoke about, if that's just a thought, if that's just an idea, does it have any power for us? Does it have any meaning for us? If it's just a thought or an idea, well, some, but not the fullness of its power until we experience it. And God manifests his glory many, many ways. And they're all, not all of them, but many of them are recorded in Scripture. And they're recorded for purpose. There's a reason why God does the things that God does. In the Old Testament, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, verbiage about God's doing something so that people may know that he is God. That they may experience the perfection, the power, the awesomeness, the glory of God by witnessing or seeing something extraordinary. And something else that indicates this is that whenever you see the word see, like looking, eyeballs, translated in scripture, there's various different Hebrew or Greek words that are can be used to translate it into that word. But there's different kinds of seeing. There's seeing something and just acknowledging, like, I see a clock, versus seeing, like, a landslide. You experience that. It's not just witnessing it, but if you're in the midst of it, you see it and experience it. So seeing with experience, that's often that word see translated in Scripture in its context. That's what it, the meaning it has. People will experience the power and the awesomeness and the glory of God through the parting of the Red Sea, um, through the thunder, through the lightning, through the clouds that, that led the people of Israel through the desert uh, during the time of the Exodus. Uh, manifest uh, throughout the Old Testament in the, the battles and the wars and the noises and all. Over and over again, God's glory is revealed in very powerful and meaningful ways. So people will see it and they experience it. And the purpose of that is so that they will know who God is through experience. They will know who God is. 
Not because God's a show. Not the purpose. Not the reason for it. It's so that people will come to the understanding that there is but one and only one God. That there are no other lowercase g gods. And we know that people throughout human history have worshipped other gods. God's again not doing it out of pride, not doing it to show off. God is perfect. God doesn't need affirmation from human beings to be recognized as God. It's strictly for our sake, for the sake of humankind, to come to know this holy and righteous and glorious and all-powerful and all-knowing, almighty, loving God as part of this plan of redemption, as part of this plan of reconciliation, as part of this plan of salvation to make God known to humankind. So people go, oh, there's only one. And it's not just through those acts of miracles. It is through the witness of nature, just seeing it in our presence. God's glory is all around us because God created everything. Well, when Christ is incarnate, when Jesus is born, there's lots of theological reasons, I suppose, for that. We'll never really understand it fully, but it is for the revelation. It is for that epiphany, if you will, sticking with the time of the church year, to reveal the humankind in a more understandable form because things like lightning and thunder scare the you-know-what out of us. But to see God manifest in human form, but to have all of the attributes still of God, all of the wisdom, all of the perfection, all of the power, the authority, the knowledge, all of that to be, to be housed in that human body makes it more relatable to us, makes it more understandable to us. Uh, makes it easier for us to have a relationship with God because of those things. But God's full power is still on display. And in the story of Jesus at the wedding, it's not about the wedding, necessarily. It's not about... Uh, it's easy to get distracted by Jesus' response to his mom. Like, <laughs> they have no more wine. Why don't you do something? And your woman, what is it to you and to me? It's not... He doesn't say it in, in the pejorative way in which it sounds. He's not being rude to his mother. Jesus was a good son. Um, his hour had not yet come, meaning the fullness of his glory had not been presented as yet on the cross. But because he's a good son, he relents. And his mom, being a you know pushy Jewish mom, says, "You, you all listen to what he has to say. He's going to fix this." So Jesus turns these. 150 gallons of water into wine. There's parts of those that are relevant and would connect more with people in that time than they really do with us. But um, in the end, it's really about at the end of that story that his glory was revealed in this first miracle. Prior to that, what had Jesus done really that was extraordinary or miraculous? I'm sure he did some things, but this is the first time that that kind of glory miraculous glory was revealed to humankind for people to witness. And it was at a wedding because there was probably lots of people there. And it was done in an extraordinary way, not just a cup here or a glass here, but six of these giant water jars, like I said, 150, possibly as much as 180 gallons of water done in an extraordinary way to display God's abundance, but the glory of Jesus was revealed that day. People saw the extraordinary nature of who Jesus was. Because you can't change water into wine. As much as some of you might want to, just turn the tap on on your faucet, right? Mm -hmm. I'd like red today. <laughs> he was revealed at that point to be God. That's what that phrase is all about. Revealed to people there witnessing that, that he was not just an amazing human. That he was fully almighty and all powerful God. And over the course of the next three years, Jesus would do that over and over and over again. Miraculous healings, raising people from the dead, walking on water, 
calming the storms. Things that only God could do. Revealed, again, sort of in a, in a way of epiphany, for all people to see so that they would come to believe. Just as it said, Jesus' disciples believed that day. What did they believe? They didn't obviously fully believe in who Jesus was. And it would take time for that to come to pass until the fullness of his glory was revealed. But in addition to the miracles and all of the power and authority that Jesus put on display, where is the fullness of God's glory manifest in his life? Where is God's glory most fully on display through the story of Jesus? It's on the cross. And that seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? We think of glory in terms of human accomplishments or great achievements to lay one's life down, to give one's life, to surrender, to be in some ways passive and allow the created to destroy the creator. That does not necessarily seem praiseworthy. And that's one of the difficult things about our faith and about the story of Jesus and about the cross and his death because it is counterintuitive to everything that we believe in. I would have loved to have had somebody there to witness me making that hole in one so I could have, you know, sort of received the glory. Last year when sports was taking place in empty stadiums, you heard athletes say, it's weird. I hit a home run or scored a touchdown or whatever, and there was no cheering. Lindy and I's four-year-old grandson, a budding soccer superstar, <laughs> it is deeply ingrained in human beings to seek praise as he plays at soccer, and we witnessed this, but also heard him after the first time, I think the first game that he played, and we saw him afterwards, Lindy said, how did you do? And he said, I scored four goals. People clapped for me. They loved me. People loved me. Because I scored goals. It's inane in us to want to seek that praise. But God doesn't seek that praise. His glory is not for His sake. His glory is revealed for our sake. His glory is manifest for the sake of of all of creation and all of humankind, that we may come to know that He is God and that He cares and that He loves because His glory is most powerfully manifest when it's sacrificial, when He had nothing to gain and God never has anything to gain from us. No amount of good works or giving or prayer or praise or whatever to never add to God's glory. He does it strictly out of a sense of love and grace for us, manifesting his power so that we know who God is and who we are. And one of the amazing things about that is because God doesn't take credit, in some ways we get to be the ones to manifest that glory of God. Who got credit for making water into wine? Well, who got credit for the wine, I should say? Who did the steward ask to come over to give praise to? While Jesus was standing there, I'm sure, witnessing it all, the chief waiter comes over, uh, calls uh, the, the groom over and says, Wow, this is amazing! Usually, people serve the best wine first until people get drunk, and then you serve the cheap stuff afterwards. It's a good strategy, by the way, for party uh, hosts. But you've done something extraordinary. You did something completely opposite of that. And the groom didn't say, it wasn't me. And Jesus didn't stand up and say, uh, hello, I was the one. He allows us to share in the glory. He allows us to manifest the glory by living sacrificially. Jesus didn't turn water into wine for his sake so that people would see it. He did it so others would see it. The waiters knew who did that. The disciples knew who did that. Ones that mattered knew who did that. But through the way that we live our lives and through the 
the idea of the body of Christ, the church, something that you heard with having to do with the gifts of the Spirit and all of that stuff, is all for the purpose of us to manifest the glory of God in human form, like Jesus did for the sake of the world, so that people may know that God exists. That they may see and experience and taste the goodness of God, the glory of God, revealed through our actions. That, to me, friends, is absolutely extraordinary. That God allows us to share in that with him, considering who God is, considering who Christ is. We are blessed. We are given an abundance of gifts in order to do that. Just as God performed or manifest his glory, as Christ manifests his glory as God, it is not done for our sake, though it's nice to get compliments on occasion. But to know that if there's no one that's watching or no one is seeing the things that you're doing other than the person who is on the receiving end of it, that glory is being manifest in you. That lives are being changed by what we do and by what we say. Absolutely extraordinary. All honor and glory and praise be to God. Amen. Amen.